Thank you, Abram, and thank you for the kind words and the introduction. I always get startled when somebody introduces me like that. Um, but as Abram said, I'm Tsapo Khobe. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Houthra and Management Agency. And today, I actually want to talk to you guys about the fact that the railways have changed. And because the railways have changed, be comfortable with it, and let's get on with it. But then you also have to balance, you know, between safety and performance management and in our BPP environment, um, it is quite challenging as we look at these unprecedented times. Now, in essence, this is the manner in which I'm going to try and do this. I've been told I've got 20 minutes, me and 20 minutes have never ever been friends, but I will try and get through this as quick as possible. Um, in essence, we'll deal with the key business challenge. What is the problem? Let's define the problem and the challenges that come through. Um, and how can we make uh, decisions through data? Um, and then we'll talk about the change between, you know, looking at trends and looking at driver-based analysis. And then we'll talk about overcrowding apps um, and what something that can be used to be able to manage railways. And then marketing and communications as a whole. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the things that we've done on the student product and then enhanced cleaning all throughout the system. And then I will conclude with that. Now, in essence, the question that comes up is what is the key business challenge? So one of the things that I want to sink in with everybody is that it is said that 15, 12 to 15% of customers will not return to public transport. So you've lost them for, for forever. Um, service levels around the world have shown that, you know, they've dropped by 65%. Um, that's a good thing because it gives you more space to be able to do maintenance. 71% of the passengers have changed the reasons for their travel. And 80% of the uh, rail operators have to change their business model. And would look at how we, you know, the, 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 the pandemic has gouged the business of, of rail as a whole. And we have to keep up with, with lockdown regulations, which means you'll have to look at how your service is configured, the frequency of how you work, and then uh, look at the travel uh, intent of the customer. The customer itself now is at the center. And the customer is dictating the manner in which we will run the railways in the next few years. Now, this is a bit of a, a heavy slide, but I want to show you where the business was uh, uh, pre-pandemic. So let me, let, let me explain to you what it means. So as you look at this, the slide itself, in the middle of the line, so this slide is actually uh, from a deck that um, was presented uh, by the Imperial College of London, uh, the strategy, uh, the transport strategy section um, that was done by um, Alex Barron. Now, in essence, what you see in the middle is what we call the break-even point. It's the point at which a railway company or an operator is able to make enough money to be able to cover the operating fee and maintenance. The gray line on top is now where now you're making enough money uh, to be able to cover your renewals and your capital projects. And as you can see, there's only probably before uh, COVID, there was only five companies around the world that could actually make that kind of money. And then there was another five that actually could uh, make up the, the break-even point. And then beyond that point, you have companies that just, just make it three of them. And if you were to ask us, where were we as a house train, we would have been probably dead center on, on, on the graph itself pre-COVID. Now, this is where everything was operating when everything was working well. Now, the question is, where are we now? So if you look at the second slide, um, the red lines that you see on the slide are the points at which uh, each one of the services fell to uh, when there was a hard lockdown. And then the green lines on top are the, are the, the pre-COVID numbers that you had seen on, on, on the previous slide itself. And then um, what you're seeing in gray is what all the services have been able to return to. You can see that in certain cases, the, the change is very big. You, a, a lot of businesses have not managed to get back to their pre-COVID uh, numbers themselves. And a lot of businesses are still struggling to be able to make it up uh, to the pre-COVID numbers. A few of the services have come back and they are getting back to their pre-COVID numbers. Now, this is a, 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 an interesting graph because it, 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 you would always assume that, you know, places like the U.S. and all of that would, would recover and North America would recover fast. And it is showing that in those places that it's not uh, that easy to recover. Asia Pacific and in particular, 
China, India have recovered quite quickly. And it's a function of population and, and, and the numbers of people that are there and the kind of terrific situations that they have. Europe itself has, is recovering. Uh, Latin America is lagging quite a lot. And if you would ask me where is Africa lying at the current moment, we're probably following the North American model in itself. Now, this is how trends numbers at the current moment. So as you can see there, um, in, in this first part here, this is the hard lockdown. We went right down to zero because we couldn't make any service. Uh, in the second part, you can see uh, the second wave. And then at the current moment, you can see we're recovering out of the third wave itself. And we've only managed to get up to, I think, probably was 35% at some point in time. And every time a, a, a challenge comes up, then uh, the numbers go down again. Now, it has been shown that rail in itself globally is lagging by 20 to 30 percent uh, as, as compared to other modes. And as, when you compare to other modes, and we're talking bus, light rail, and suburban rail, and, and, and metros themselves. So you can see rail in itself, it's, it's far behind um, a lot of other services. Now, the same thing has happened on the how train. If you look at the how train itself, uh, the, the line right down on the bottom, that's rail and our, our buses, they've always tracked each other. So as you can see, they're sitting probably at 25% of pre-COVID numbers. And then we've got the smaller service, which is the midi buses, the 22-seater buses, which have almost come back to uh, 80 to 90% of their, um, you know, uh, pre-COVID numbers. They've been hit by, you know, the various... Um, uh, waves of, of the lockdown itself, but you can see that it has bounced back quite heavily. Now, one of the other things that we track quite heavily as the how train, as the how train was intended to be able to take people out of their cars, is how the freeway is um, is performing. So the red line up on the top there, that's the the the, the, the freeways themselves. On, on on the top graph, you've got the north south corridor. Um, which if you were to look at it, that's the N1 M1 area and also the N14 uh, combining with the uh, the N1 and the M1. Um, and as you can see. Traffic on the road has bounced back, um, but rail in itself is still struggling quite heavily. Uh, our we as, as the health are still struggling quite heavily, way behind that. But one of the things that you'll see in pre-COVID times was that we had a, a, a we had a a, a a correlation which was almost close to 0.95 with where we were. So if if Central goes up, we go up. If the freeways go up, we go up. Uh, if we go down, they they go down too. Uh, but you can see that post-COVID, we have not been on the bottom graph. It's the east-west uh, corridor, um, and you can see we have not. So, but the beauty about it is of that correlation is that the freeway is starting to get congested again, and therefore you can see that the numbers are also increasing um, on the how train side. Long-term change that we're talking about that you have to be comfortable with is that I said to you, 15% of the uh, uh, customers will not return. Uh, and their behavior has changed. They are more on an off-peak travel and probably people trying to do social distancing. Uh, they are also choosing earlier peaks. Uh, peaks have flattened themselves. Um, in terms of the type of ticketing, uh, people are going less for, for season tickets, which is the monthlies and the weeklies, uh, and they're opting for pay as you go. Probably a function of not knowing when you know it's going to be with immediate effect. Um, and and you, you people have to have control and have their money still in their in their hands. Uh, so therefore, they opt for pay as you go, and they they buying more weeklies as as as, as or a seven day pass. In terms of locations they travel to, less to central business districts. Um, they are doing more local neighborhood travel uh, more than anything else. It's we're not really very clear whether we're still talking about shorter and longer journeys, but it's not yet out. It's still out there. One of the most important things that have, have occurred is that you have more younger customers, more lower income customers. Um, there's few students, but students are returning in South Africa as a whole, and you'll see what we've done with it. Um, fewer tourists and fewer office professionals are returning to the office. In terms of the how train, if you were to look at what they call it, our ticket preferences, as you can see, 
our poor pay as you go, our stock travel rights area has grown quite heavily. Um, if you looked at our 35 day pass, which is our monthlies, they have not had any growth at all. And in essence, people opting for seven day passes um, because then they, they can manage their travel. And when they say it's with immediate effect, then you, you still have your money in your pocket. And these are our, are, are our actual numbers as of probably a month ago. Um, when you look at the work from home, uh, you know, it has grown quite a lot. Uh, and then people who work half and half, uh, you know, in a hybrid situation also has grown quite heavily. Um, people who work at the premises, um, the world will not return to there. So we have to actually understand what we're going to do with the additional uh, capacity that we have as a system. Now, one of the things for you to be able to do that, you have to be driven by data. You have to be able to have the numbers to have in and around you. Now, in, in, in essence, a lot of people believe that they are working at the most optimum level, which is they have the ability to predict um, in terms of the analytics. But the modern way of doing things is where the data now prescribes to you what your strategy should be. And people should be opting for more wanting to become a, 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 at the level of prescriptive analytics rather than the predictive side. Um, a lot of railways are more still on the diagnostic side, and that will not be able to change the business that much. And you want to opt to, to, to as quickly as possible get to the level where your, your data is dictating to you and it's giving you the insights that you need to be able to do what you need to do. As we do that, what are we trying to do? Keeping the customer at the center is identifying opportunities and risk across the, 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 the business value chain. And then from then onwards, build new data-driven services. And from the data-driven services, then you analyze what you're getting because there's data behind that. So, so, so the metadata that you get behind that, uh, you have to be able to manage it to be able to create a secondary data that allows you to be able to say, how do I automate my business processes to be able to um, achieve better operational efficiencies? In essence, you have to do this. You have to make sure that you have categories of what we call value pools. What are the areas that you can actually be able to say, um, I'll be able to extract the most value out of and then it's not free for all. You're not going at this, you know, uh, you know, in, in you know what we used to refer in South Africa as a Rambo Skid approach, approach, you know, scattergun approach. Um, you, you have to create these value pools. So digital marketing is one of those. So redesign your website and your digital advertising. Your social media also plays a, a big part on that side. Digital channels also are an important part. So onboarding your customer, and I'll talk to that a bit, and what we've done in, 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 on that basis. Um, digitize uh, support capabilities and give your workforce the ability to do the work that they need to do. Um, digitally enable products, data platforms, and advanced security that you can bring onto your, your, your business itself. And then from a prescriptive uh, perspective, your business model in terms of innovation has to bring in uh, the issue of how do you use data in your maintenance as a whole. Now, from that notion, how do we use things like driver-based analysis? And when you think about driver-based analysis, I said to you when I spoke to you about data earlier on is that we got to move from being reactive because when you're watching your trends, it means you have to wait until uh, you've got enough data in your hand to be able to understand what the, 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 the customer is going to do. Now, when you start looking at, at, at external driver-based analysis, you, you start saying, what does the customer want to do? In actual fact, start asking the customer themselves what they want to do. So you create intent. And then from then onwards, you match uh, the, 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 the intent in itself. And then you create a service that actually works with what the customer wants to do. And then from then onwards, you optimize by making sure that the feedback loop is there. Uh, from you understanding the customer's intent and and, and, and what we call the, the, the in-moment purpose. So when, when a customer decides right now, this is what I want to do, and this is how I'm going to do it, that's where you're going to find the true value. Rather than the old way logic of where we just put out schedules and then those schedules are what we give to the customer, um, rather than looking at what they really want to do. In essence, it's about us being able to say, how do you create preference out of a customer? And what is their path to what purchase? Or them being able to make a decision to go with your service rather than anybody else's service. In essence, what you have to do is be able to say, so on, on, on the top part of the graph, what you're seeing in the, in, in the yellow part or in the golden part in, in, in the towers, it's the capacity itself. On the blue uh, or, or the dark blue lines over here, 
what you're seeing here is the area uh, um, is actually the the way the the capacity gets used and on top of that what you're seeing is is in actual fact excess capacity that you are carrying in your service as a whole and so you will have to be able to understand what do you do with these peaks because this is our old way of scheduling services you give the services as they are in addition to that you also have to understand how your your, your passengers are using your service from every station and if you look on the second graph on the bottom here the second graph is showing you when does every station peak when does it actually uh, um, uh, um, when do people start coming into the gate and through your ticketing system you are able to extract enough value to say when can i put on an eight car um, in a station such as Hatfield. When do I need to, and as you can see, is the first one has to definitely be between 6.30 and 6.45 um, because that's when everybody starts arriving in, um, in, in, in Hatfield station. And in different stations themselves, then your service has to be able to cover the, the, exactly that because that's the manner in which uh, uh, the customer behaves rather than what we provide. In essence, you also have to understand that what is the actual origin of your um, your original origin of, of, of your customer and what station do they prefer? And from you being able to understand that, you also have to understand the direction of travel and when do they peak? When well, when does every station have come to the point where it's it's got peak demand and therefore fit the, the, the your, your service to what's, what needs to be done? Through that, you are then able to do one thing. To manage your overcrowding, and as you can, as you uh, as you would understand, around the globe, everybody has been working on overcrowding management. And when you look at overcrowding management in itself, so from uh, MTR in Hong Kong, as you can see on their platforms, they can show you which of the coaches are full, and which of the coaches um, are still at what they call it at an average level, and then which of the coaches are free. And everybody wants to be able to understand that. At the current moment for the sake of social distancing but long term wise you have to develop this in such a way that it allows you to be able to uh, to manage overcrowding all around um in in the washington metro they've combined with google maps and they can give you each line uh, you know the the services how they're functioning and which of the services are, are, are working well the one that we have opted for and that we like uh, was the idea that is, was brought in by, uh, you know, Sydney Metro. And it is about us being able to create advanced personalized alerts and then being able to predict occupancy through AI and the information that you have. How have we used that? Um, we've developed a plugin and that will be going live with the next update of our, of our, our current app, um, which allows you simple things on a three-click rule. And the three-click rule says your customer has to be able to find everything they need in three clicks. And what it does is the, the, the customer says, I'm moving from this station and going to that station. And immediately after they've done that, they check for avail they press the check availability and they tell you the time of travel. And that will tell them whether they have a, a service or not. And, and then also, immediately after that, then they, they, they can then select alternative services. It will give them a service that is uh, uh, possible that they can get on that is near to the one that they want. Um, and then also recommend one that will be completely empty and would allow them for uh, to be able to do social distancing. Now, this in itself, initially you are developing for social distancing purposes and for COVID and for, for, for the pandemic. But you got to think long term. A lot of the stuff that a lot of people are doing at the current moment, they're only developing for the now and rather develop for the long term more than anything else. And this long term, and that is why I don't talk about it as social distancing management. It's called overcrowding management. Long term wise, the same part of the app will be used to be able to manage our overcrowding um, on the system. In itself, we spoke about measuring and then re-measuring post travel. Once you have created the service that aligns to the needs of the customer, then you have to you have the ability to then have the analytics in the back, integrate your services with other services, and then make sure that your train schedule is aligned to, to, to passenger needs rather than just giving the information or, or giving a schedule that just is there, as we have always done in the railways. We provide a schedule and it's a take it or leave it basis. And rather we provide what do they call it to, to issues of you know what we've done on the marketing and communication side because that was a big part of what what we did 
And in, in, in the area of innovation, one of the first few things, the number one rule in that, that our marketing and communications is that during crisis, you never go dark. Um, and that has been shown by various companies around the world it, in the manner that they have communicated and they have used their, um, their marketing and communication to communicate with their customer and communicate uh, uh, different bits of information. As you can see, the Sao Paulo Metro, uh, Metro Lisboa and uh, Berlin uh, BBG and, 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 in, and in Oslo and Metro Rio, uh, a lot of information was got. From our end, one of the first things that we did in that month when everything went dead, um, we kept the conversation going. Um, on the one end, we had pro invited uh, uh, Prof. Karim um, to come and talk to what does the, the pandemic mean? What does the lockdowns mean? And, and therefore, with the shared value, we are providing our customer with information. On the other end, then we kept on talking about the benefit of the Houdrin as a socioeconomic development and, 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 and its impact on society. On the other end, it was just simple uh, letting people know what is the Houdrin doing in terms of um, you know, making sure that we're keeping them safe. On the other end, um, we also took the opportunity because there's, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. We also took an opportunity to be able to uh, you know, market certain services that we had already implemented, but we had not launched in full. And some of those services are the ability for you to pop up your, to top up your ticket online. Uh, the second service that we we took chance to be able to market was the issue of uh, our EMV services. So the ability for you to use your credit card when you don't need to actually go and acquire a ticket or go to a vending a ticket a vending machine for you to access services. You could just take your own credit card and we have already implemented that and it's in full use um, on the system. So that was an opportunity that we took, but noting from the, the area of the fact that those services we had already innovated and developed them in full. So therefore all we needed to do is market them out there. And in essence, there's also the bit where you use your current setup uh, to, 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 to share information as a whole. From then on, what we... Sorry to yep. interject, we are left with one minute. I That is okay. fine, I'm about to finish yes. this. I'm about to finish. So we also adapted our, our products to be able to allow, you know, for students to have um, access to uh, the system in itself, uh, giving a 25% discount from there. And then um, we developed the program of riding with the Jeep. And in addition to that, then we then uh, uh, created a marketing opportunity from there. Uh, we brought on our enhanced cleaning all around the world. Everybody's gone with enhanced cleaning, people using robotics, using ultraviolet light. This is an important slide because in essence, it's showing a lot of metros are not being cleaned in the past. And therefore the pandemic has brought up the issue of cleaning all around. As you can see, we've cleaned our services quite a lot and, 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 and uh, uh, um, focusing on, on important touch point. This slide says you to you, you will not be able to scale back. And therefore a lot of these services will have to be kept up as you continue uh, into the future. And you also have to manage the effectiveness versus perception uh, and create visibility on your system. And we created visibility, even including um, bringing on carte blanche to come and look at our services as they were. To a great degree, what this slide says to you is you're going to have to change your business model and you have to uh, create the resilience through, through adaptation and then making sure that your social media and your marketing and your ability to be able to attract your services is based on what you can give more. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the wonderful, insightful uh, presentation. Indeed, uh, 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 very welcome, uh, very exciting. We see quite a lot of likes uh, uh, around our audience, and, and, and I want to give them the opportunity to interact with you. Uh, I've noted that the, the facilities for questions and discussion has not been used. I encouraged our uh, guests uh, to, to use that facilities. But those who have questions, uh, you are welcome to pose those questions. I'll, I'll pose them to Dr. Kobe. But for me, for where I'm sitting, Dr. Kobe, uh, having noted on some of your slides that the, the, uh, there is a decline in, in, in terms of the passengers uh, or services, rather, 
how then do we balance uh, uh, this uh, change and innovation to the cost of a business that are fixed. Uh, maybe if you you can enlighten us in terms of how are you dealing with that, uh, so that it also help our audience as we 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 engage. Uh, how do we go back uh, from here to 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 get our business back into 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 the right space? That is one of the questions that I would want to post while I'm I'm looking for. Uh, certain questions on the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you, Abram. I, and I think that, that that is the important challenge at the current moment. And, and that 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 the important challenge is the fact that um, our budgets have come under strain um, as a whole in, in in all of the businesses. And in essence, the question that comes up is how do you balance bringing on the additional cost that you have brought on in terms of the cleaning and everything else? And it's about us reinventing our business model and us creating resilience out of that business model. We, we, one of the things that we, we realize is that we, at times during a strike or during a, a challenge, we can run the service with much fewer drivers and auto vehicle um, and, uh, and, and, and conductors. And, and that would ask, what, what are we doing with the rest of the people that are there? And so you actually, the, 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 the pandemic, as I'll, I'll say it over and over again, a crisis is a bad thing to waste. Um, you know, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. What we've taken time to do is ask the questions. What are we doing with all these people? And it's not only on the people side, it's also on the rolling stock, on the bus side. Everything else, you will have to be able to look at it. And in addition, I showed you the one side where the midi buses are doing better than the buses themselves and have become part of regional transport. So one of the decisions that we've made is our model of expansion is going to be based on the midi buses uh, rather than going with buses. So I have no intent of any, owning any more buses. So therefore, you, you pivot like a ballerina. you got to move fast. And that's one of those things. And the, 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 the railways industry has not been known for, for pivoting. Uh, we, 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 we are, we are legacies. We, that's the thing that we, we love our systems and we, we love how, what we do. So we will have to become comfortable. And as I say to you, any, any executive at the current moment who does not acquaint themselves with data and the platform economy, please get out of the way. Let the youngsters uh, take over from you. We know you know your railways, but uh, the railways are not going to survive if we're going to depend on people who know nothing about data. Uh, Avram, just to bring your attention to the question from Dr. Mabila Matebula on the Discuss um, uh, platform, uh, asking should uh, the voice of the regulator be uh, prioritized over the voice of the customer? That's your question there, Zeppo. No, no, no. Uh, the, the, should, the, should the voice of the regulator be um, prioritized over the voice of the customer? It is a balance, and, and, and a balance that we have to straddle quite carefully. The regulations remain in place, and with the regulations remaining in place, we have to make sure that the, the, the regulations are agile enough. And, and, and I, if I don't foc I focus on any other thing, uh, uh, let me focus on the issue of agility. Our ability to pivot as an industry uh, as, uh, as a whole, and our ability to work with each other with the regulator, to be able to create agile way of regulating, um, and being able to make sure that when we give services to the customer, we have to be able to, it, 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 we can't wait three weeks after the minister, you know, at Cocta has said something for us to get regulations. Um, the, the, the regulator and us should already be discussing what are the inputs that we need to give into that and how are we as an industry going to, um, you know, uh, um, advance the regulations as they are. And as I say, agility is important. And, and that has been my biggest struggle in the last 18 months. Um, and therefore, it's not one over the other. It's just us being agile enough to can be able to service the customer. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Kobe, uh, for the very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I wish we had more time that we go further into the issues. But I guess uh, our guests are, are, are really, really excited uh, uh, with what you have shared with us. And as, 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 as industry, I guess we've picked up quite a lot, digital, digitalization, data management, uh, and so forth. I would like to thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, it was a, a very insightful, very excellent presentation. Uh, our guests, do not forget uh, to 
uh, rate uh, our, our speaker, Mr. Kobe, as um, uh, we were uh, directed a 